Hello, I'm Ramey. And I'm Pip. And this is Brother Knows Quest, the podcast where I, your host, introduce my sister to the wonderful world of tabletop role-playing games. Pip, do you have any idea what we're talking about today? I never do. I know, it's lovely. A surprise. Well, that's new. It's not hardback. No, it's not hardback. Apocalypse World. Yes, Apocalypse World. It was such a, a unique take on RPGs or tabletop versions of RPGs. It's caught on and they've used the basic rules in it and made a whole bunch of other games. All kinds of people have made different games they made. Well, I'll cover a bunch of them later, but this is the first. You have it. Who wrote it? D. Vincent Baker. M E G U E Y. Megway? I guess. I really, I don't Baker? know. Baker? Yeah. So I'm guessing they're related. Their husband and wife, I believe. Huh. The setting basically is something. Well, it's apocalyptic, but you decide what kind of apocalypse it is. The rules tell you in the book, do not plan ahead. Your group will help make this game and its setting. You don't have to prep for it at all if you're running the game. The back says, something is wrong with the world, and I don't know what it is. It well, I, be- can make, I can make a good list about that. Yeah. <laughs> it used to be a better, of course. It did. In the golden age of legend, when there was enough to eat, enough hope, when there was one nation under God, and the people could lift their eyes and see beyond the horizon. Beyond the day, children were born happy and grew up rich. Hmm. Now, that's not what we've got. Clearly. Yeah. It is a unique, it's more of a narrative game. It's a 2D6 game, so you roll 2D6s to get the outcome. If you are the dungeon master or games master, you are called the master of ceremonies, the MC. Hmm. Um, It usually takes a few sessions to play through the game. And it should be taking place, nobody remembers how or why, maybe nobody never knew. The oldest survivors have childhood memories of it, cities burning, society in chaos and then collapse, families set to panicked flight. As the world died, it created a psychic maelstrom, as the game calls it, of dread and all the torment of the whole world's population dying off for the most part. So there's a little bit of psychic stuff going on in the game since that incident occurred. Whatever incident your group decides, it's left up. Uh, in the air for people to pick out what they want. It uses playbooks. The playbooks and the reference sheets contain all the rules that players need to use. If you're the uh, master of ceremonies, of course, the book has a lot of the stuff you need to follow, all the special things you can do. As the playbooks are, I guess you could look at them as your class. Everybody's human in this, unless you want to change something. There's ways to change it. You have a little bit of a mutation or something like that. It have been, depending on what uh, scenarios or whatever you want to make your world go through. But the playbooks are nice. It's basically like a little pamphlet you unfold if you print it out. And it has all the stuff your character can do, all the stuff it could do in the future. You just basically fill in a dot beside what you want it to get as you level up or advance, the game calls it. It's more of a conversation gameplay is. The MC does not really do any of the roles, kind of like Cypher System. Players will roll, and depending on how well they roll, that is when the, if they roll badly or in the middle, he can kind of do something the MC can. But if you roll really badly, that's when prepare for the worst for the players, but that's when the MC gets to do what he wants to do, use some of his moves. All character playbooks list the same set of basic moves, plus each playbook lists a set of special moves just for that character. Your threats might also have special moves, depending on what the MC has in your threat list. This game also works in a way the MC will have a big overhanging threat on like a countdown, depending on how bad things go for you. The clock is ticking, technically, and eventually the big bad thing will happen, and you have, as the players, you will have ways to stop that through different interactions. And if you don't do anything or roll badly the whole time, the big bad thing will happen. It could be a series of small battles knowing that someone's coming to raid your stronghold or whatever you're held up in during the apocalypse. If you don't handle it the right way, uh, eventually the clock will tick down and the big bad army will show up and take your stuff. Whatever you want it to be. It could be a a bomb about to go off that's ticking down. Whenever the character does something uh, that counts as a move, that's when you roll the dice. Each move says what the stat the player should add to the roll. Uh, It'll say roll plus a stat. So you take your roll and the two dice, add that together, and add plus whatever your stat is. If it adds up to six or less, the roll plus your stat, it's a miss. And usually the MC will get to do something bad to you. If it's a seven or more, it's a hit on a seven to nine. It's a weak hit. And that means if it's an enemy, normally they will hit you and you will hit them as well. Middle of the ground kind of thing. And if it's a 10 plus total, it's a strong hit and you really don't have no negative effects coming back to you. But when you roll middle to low, it's how the MC does anything at all. Usually it's a player-based thing. Every move has a list of things that should happen on a 7 to 9 or a 10 plus. And many of them also has things that should happen on a complete miss. So anything 6 or lower. The basic moves, though, just tell the players, be prepared for the worst. 
if you fail on that. Every character also has on their playbook a special move that kicks in whenever they have sex with someone. Um, it is Apocalypse. It's the gritty okay. game. It's like the grittiest game I've ever talked about on here, I believe. <laughs> now, the stats I was talking about, you roll plus your stat, depending on what move you pick. They are cool, meaning cool under fire, rational, clear thinking, calm, calculating, unfazed. Roll plus cool to do something under fire. Hard, meaning hard hearted, violent, aggressive, strong willed, mean, physically and emotionally strong. Roll plus hard to go aggro on someone. Like aggression. Aggression. Mm -hmm. uh, hot, meaning, well, hot. Attractive. Subtle. Gracious. Sexy. Beautiful. Inspiring. Exciting. Roll plus hot to seduce or manipulate someone. Sharp. And by the way, the last sentence and everything I'd explain here, seduce or manipulate someone part, those are basic moves. They're just giving samples of why you would roll them. Sharp, meaning sharp-witted, clever, alert, smart, perceptive, educated. Skilled, trained, roll plus sharp to read a person or read a situation. Basically, kind of get an idea of what someone's thinking or what's happened in this situation. And then there's weird, meaning weirdo, psychic, genius, uncanny, lucky, strange, prophetic, touched. Roll plus weird to open your brain to the world's psychic maelstrom. And then there's HX, meaning history. Share history of how well one character knows another. At the beginning, at the end of each game, you will uh, pick another player and talk about how your relationship has went up a level or down a level and can roll plus HX some particular person to help or interfere with them in the middle of the game or something like that. That's why that's a stat all to itself. It's, it's actually a very simple game. Like I said, it's more of a narrative. You, you have to, it takes you out of the D&D stuff. D&D, &D, you have a very specific list of things you can do and a very specific set of rules to how to do those and when you can use them. And this, it's up for interpretation. You're like, I want to try and seduce my way out of this, or I want to try and use this very interesting thing my character's good at to get out of this. Can I roll plus this stat instead of saying, I'm going to dodge this in D&D? &D, you literally have to use the acrobatics skill, pretty much. The way harm works in the game, if you take injuries or something like that, that's like a clock, and it's literally called harm before six heals automatically with time. Harm after nine gets worse with time. Harm, uh, unless uh, stabilized, sorry. If the player marks a segment to 11 to 12, the character's life has become untenable. When a character's life becomes untenable, the player has to choose how to continue. Death is an option, but there are others. It is a very interesting way of marking hell. If you have experience bubbles to fill in on your character sheet. You can get experience through three methods in the game. You can roll one of her two highlighted stats. So when you start the game, you get to highlight two stats. Second is when you use the HX with someone, goes to plus four or negative three. So if your relationship is getting really bad or really good, you can mark experience if the HX. Third is when a move tells her to. So if one of your moves say, oh, you've done this, mark experience. If you get five experience bubbles, she improves her character towards the back of each playbook are the rules that the character's improvements. You can choose new moves, sometimes get a gang or a holding or whatever. It improves in stats sometimes. Then when you do that, you start over at zero again. You can improve five times, and then the AMC will open up new options for you if you want, after five level ups. So basically, there's five levels. Mm. Now, here's the playbooks you can play as. And there's a whole lot more other than this in other books. They have come out with so many things since this came out. Like I said, this is the first of the Powered by the Apocalypse games. It's the second edition of the first thing, anyway. The Angel. When you're lying in the dust of the Apocalypse world, guts are spilled. From whom do you pray? The gods. They're long gone. Your beloved comrades? You wouldn't be here in the first place without them. Your precious old mother, she's a darling, but she can't put your insides back in. <laughs> no, you pray for some grinning kid or veteran or just someone with a heart shocker and a hand with uh, sutures and a six pack of morphine. When that someone comes, that's the angels. Angels are medics. Are you sure it's not just the morphine? They say if everything is going well, maybe nobody's relying on you at the moment. So it kind of gets boring for you. Make interesting relationships so you'll stay relevant. Or sabotage things, I guess. Sabotage sounds more fun. It does. I like the little descriptions they give here. Uh, usually they're really good things or really bad things or both. The Battle Babe. They're the ones like the seductive blue crackling light, you know? You mistake looking at them for falling in love and you get too close and then it's a zillion volts and your wings are burnt off like paper. Uh, they're dangerous. Battle Babes are good in battle, of course, but they're wicked social too. Play this if you want to play something dangerous and provocative. <laughs> Yeah, I knew it was going to be different when I was flipping through it earlier and close to the back. It said advanced fuckery. Yeah, <laughs> I love this game. And it's got a seductive looking woman 
holding on to a man and a woman on the other side. Yeah. Is that the battle babe, I'm guessing? That sounds right. I don't know. Well, it says the battle babe is better at making trouble than getting out of it. And then there's the brainer. Brainers are the weird psychic people. They have brain control, puppet strings, creepy hearts, dead souls, and eyes like broken things. They stand in your peripheral vision and whisper into your head strings. They're just sort of tasteful accoutrement that no well-appointed hard holder would do without. Hard holder, we'll talk about that in a minute. Brainers are spooky, weird, and really fun to play. If you want everybody else to be at least a little bit afraid of you, the brainer's a good choice. The brainer's really all about getting somebody to have sex with them, too. It says, warning, you'll be happy, but to be the happiest if somebody wants to have sex with you. Why is that a warning? And they have little warnings like that, like I mentioned, like uh, here at the chopper. Apocalypse world is all scarcity. Of course it is, it's apocalypse. There's not enough wholesome food, not enough untainted water, not enough security, not enough light, not enough electricity, not enough children, not enough hope. So choppers are who you are. Choppers lead bike gangs. They're powerful, but lots of their power is external in their gang. If you want to weigh in and throw around, play a chopper. Warning, externalizing your power means drama. Expect drama. Basically, you lead a biker gang. It's kind of weird that they put a biker gang in here. I guess if you want to go the Mad Max kind of gameplay, it makes sense. And then you have the hard holder, the person I mentioned earlier. Psychic people would be kind of close to. There is no government, no society in Apocalypse World. Used to be all, you know, it goes in their version of describing how the world used to be with countries and everything. Now anyone with a concrete compound and a gang full of gunslingers can claim the title hard holder. Hard holders are landlords, warlords, governors of their own little strongholds. If anybody plays a hard holder in the game, the game's going to have serious and immobile home base. Uh, warning, don't be a hard holder unless you want all the burdens. So you rule whatever. Now if you want a mobile game, something like you're Mad Maxing on cars going through the desert and all that, you might want to play something other than a hard holder. I guess they could have that though, if you think about it. Somebody had to lead those gangs, right? The Hocus. I like the Hocus. It's my favorite of all these. Now, it should be crystal clear that the gods have abandoned Apocalypse World. Theory is that these weird Hocus people, <laughs> when they say the gods, what they really mean is miasma left over from the explosion of psychic hate and depression that gave Apocalypse World its birth. Friends, that's our creator now. Just a psychic maelstrom of hate. Hocus have cult followers, the way choppers have gangs. They're strong, social, public, and compelling. If you want to sway mobs, play a Hocus. Warning, things are going to come looking for you. Being a cult leader means having to deal with your fucking cult. (laughs) I'll tell you why I love it so much here later. I'll give you some examples of other things you can go listen to, some live streams or actual plays that are real good and where it's kind of any setting you want to drop this into you and your group can agree and build your characters around that setting the driver came the apocalypse the infrastructure of the golden age tore apart roads have split lines of life and communication shattered a few living still remember it every horizon scorching hot with civilization in flames light to put out the stars and the moon smoke to put out the sun apocalypse world's horizons are dark Drivers have cars, meaning mobility, freedom, and a place to go. If you can't see the post-apocalypse without cars, you gotta be a driver. Warning, your loose ties can accidentally keep you out of the action. Commit to the other characters to stay in play. So pretty much you can get in your car and just drive around and have nothing to do with anybody? Mm -hmm. Well, that sounds like a good plan. Yeah. The Gunslinger. Apocalypse World is a mean, ugly, violent place. Law and society have broken down completely. What's yours is yours, and only while you can hold it in your hands, there is no peace. Sometimes the obvious move is the right one. Gunslingers are the very baddest of asses. Their moves are simple, direct, and violent. Crude, even. If you want to take no shit, play a gunslinger. Warning, like angels, if things are going well, you might be kicking your heels. Interesting relationships can keep you in the scene. Pretty much the warrior. We have four more. The Skinner. It's the one I don't understand the most. Even in the filth of Apocalypse World, there's food that isn't death on a spit. Music that isn't shrieking hyenas. Thoughts that aren't afraid. Bodies that aren't used meat. Dancing that's real. There are moments that are more than stench, smoke, rage, and blood. Anything beautiful left in the ugly world, Skinners hold it. Will they share it with you? What do you offer them? Skinners are pure hot. They're entirely social and they have great directly manipulative moves. Play a Skinner if you want to be unignorable. Warning, Skinners have the tools, but unlike hardholders, choppers, and hocuses, 
they don't have a steady influx of motivation. You have the most fun if you can roll your own. Then there's the Mastro D. What? It, yeah, Mastro D. In the golden age of legend, there was this guy named Mastro. He was known for dressing up real dap, and wherever he went, the people had much lux tune. There was this other guy named the Maitre D. He was known for dressing up real dap, and wherever he went, the people had all the food they could eat, the fanciest of it. Here in Apocalypse World, those two guys are dead. They died, and the fat sizzled off them. <laughs> they died the same as much lux tune, and all you can eat. The Master D, now, he can't give you what these guys used to. Maybe he can find you a little something, something to take off the edge. The Master D runs a social establishment like a bar, a drug den, or a bordello. I don't know what that is, do you? How do you spell it? B-O-R-D-E-L-L-O. A brothel. Oh, I love that word. I like brothel. It's because I play a lot of fantasy games. If you want to be sexier than a hard holder with fewer obligations and less stuff to deal with, play a Master D. Warning, fewer obligations and less stuff to deal with, not none, and none, so you will have something to deal with. The Savvy Head. If there's one thing that you can count on in the Apocalypse world, it's things break. Savvy Heads are techies. They have really cool abilities in the form of their workspace, and a couple of fun reality-bending moves. Play a Savvy Head if you want to be powerful and useful as an ally. Warning, your workspace depends on your resources, and a lot of them, so make friends with everyone you can to get more resources. And that's, I don't want to. Yeah, I know. I'd like to be the cult leader. Every character, now here's the basic moves. That's the list of the ones in the book. There's add-ons galore for this since it came out. I'll mention some of that later, where you can find them at least. The basic moves. Do something under fire. Go aggro on someone. Sucker someone. Do battle. Seduce or manipulate someone. Help or interfere with someone. Read a situation. Read a person. Open your brain to the world's psychic maelstrom. And the last one is session end. It's in, you end the game session. The MC's moves are separate them try to get the party separated capture someone put someone in a spot trade harm for harm basically when you're doing you know attacks and you roll in the middle you as the mc can hurt the player and they can hurt you Mm. announce off-screen badness basically kind of like a movie showing you the bad guy doing something that the good guys would never know about if you weren't watching the movie Announce future badness so that the clock I mentioned can start counting down. Inflict harm. Take away their stuff. Make them buy. Activate their stuff's downside. Some moves have downsides. Tell them the possible consequences and ask. Offer an opportunity with or without a cost. Turn their moves back on them. Make a threat move, which is one of those threats I was telling you about. Could have or just activate because the timer's right out pretty much. After every move, what do you do? So make sure the conversation keeps going. The player's always doing something. That's what the MC can do. And a lot of them can't be done at all unless uh, the players are already rolled badly on something. And that's the basics of the game. I ain't going to go into the specifics of the characters, what they can do. There's just so much to go over. But it's right there on the sheet. It's easy to play. The hardest job in it is the MC. If you're familiar with the video game or the series Fallout, if you want an idea how this game can be played, a group on YouTube called uh, Happy Jacks RPG has a Fallout apocalypse world game it's up on youtube and it's vault 818 how flexible this game is they've made the driver into a a woman wearing power armor instead of a car and there's a cult leader the hocus and all that stuff as well there's so many different ways but if you want a, a basic idea how this game is played watch vault 818 happy jacks rpgs on youtube and the next few episodes i'm going to be covering other apocalypse world games not made by the same people but with the same rules so a lot of them might be vague on their um, setting because it's meant to be built up around how the characters choose to play. I've always wanted to run a Fallout one. Is there any apocalyptic movies or shows or anything you like, Beth? The ones where natural disasters destroy everything. Well, that would be pretty easy to do, wouldn't it? I also like zombies, the basic zombies. Well, that would be perfect for this. <laughs> I think you could do it with a zombie game as well. I can't imagine Someone hasn't already made rules to fit this book and published it somewhere for zombie situations Mm. specifically. Yeah, that's the most basic. Beth, would you play this if I picked like a a disastrous situation? Yeah. Okay. Would you play a game where it's really more about the story and you only roll whenever one particular thing has to happen or a few particular things come up? Like the only reason you need to roll is for all the moves I mentioned. Mm -hmm. Until then, you just talk about what your characters are doing and all that. And then you roll if one of those situations come up. You roll more than you Isn't think you that do. What it normally is, anyway. Yes, but there's fewer reasons to roll in this game. It's like I said, mm. it's a narrative-based game, and combat is very dangerous. One of the character moves that popped out to me 
was um do you remember when we were on vacation and there was graffiti and you it said art is not a crime and you said it is if it's on somebody else's wall yeah okay well the one that popped out to me is it's not just murder it's an art oh goodness <laughs> was that the battle babe or something i don't know apocalypse <laughs> uh, advanced fuckery is the section it's in oh, okay <laughs> <laughs> um, there's a huge section in here to help you learn how to run the game if you're the mc like most of the book is for the mc and it tells you how to make threats and all that stuff. There's newer games that have used this kind of rule system of Powered by the Apocalypse, and they've simplified so much of it. Next week, we'll talk about another one that's a lot easier, and it's a cross between the rules in this and Dungeons and Dragons. It's called Dungeon World. If you're interested in it, the PDFs, like at the moment, it's 20 bucks. You can find it just by Googling it. It's a fun book to read, if nothing else. I like the fact that they, it, it would probably be more funny because of things like advanced fuckery and that isn't normally used in books like this yeah or i guess games like this it's more adult certainly yeah you can i guess fix it to where children can play it if you didn't mind uh like highlighting over some words in their character sheets i'd say (laughs) or their playbooks advanced Uh, budgery (laughs) yeah you don't let them have the main core book and just give them their playbooks and try to keep everybody else in line i can't say that this is perfect for children okay it's up to you and your children there isn't a rating on it i don't believe because it's a book I don't think books should have ratings. I'm not no. one of those people. Well. And now some magazines need ratings. <laughs> um, now, I have recently got us a affiliate links attached to drive RPG. It's like the online biggest RPG store you could have. If you want PDFs, they print out a lot of stuff. It's a lot of stuff you won't find anywhere else but drive through RPG. I have got us an affiliate link to Apocalypse World. If you find that in the description of this episode, you'll be able to help us out and get the book fairly cheap for yourself because they have a good sale going on right now at the time of this recording. And usually they have good sales anyway. So if I was you, I'd check them out. They haven't paid me to do this or anything. I just signed up for the affiliate program and here we are. I love this game. Look forward to more Apocalypse powered books in the future from us. If you like what you hear here, we have other podcasts on our podcast network. It's called Gruesome Gaming Group. I'll leave the link in the description. And we have a podcast called Horrific History and Hauntings. It's a podcast where my sister tells me about uh, some weird thing that the history books ignore because it's usually horrific and they can't put it in history books, for children at least. Sometimes there's hauntings in them. Usually, sometimes it's just funny, horrible stories that we find. There is a Leveling Duo. It's a podcast where me and my friend Dakota talk about video games that have had an effect on our life, usually in a good way. I don't think we've talked about one we haven't had fun with yet. I'm talking about Starfield this last episode. The hype, I'm going through a lot of emotions, hoping how well Starfield plays out after my time with all the Bethesda games in the past. Could you leave us a review? It'd be nice to know what people think. We have a Twitter account, a Gruesome Gaming G, if you want to tweet at us. Uh, look up Gruesome Gaming Group if you want us on YouTube. We're thinking about starting to post more stuff on there. I guess that's it. Beth, thanks for listening to it. I've been Ramey. And I'm Beth. And this has been Brother Nose Quest. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.